Okay, I thought we'd start this morning with a quick quiz question. Okay, now I need the PowerPoint up there. Sorry. Yeah, okay. The 1997 song Bittersweet Symphony was a hit for which Britpop band? Okay, was it A, The Verve, B, Oasis, C, Suede, or D, Blur? Okay, anyone going to go with the verb? Oh, you know, you know this one, do you? Okay, right. Just, okay, just, maybe everyone's going to watch you now. Okay, everyone's, anyone going to go for the verb? Does anyone say it's the verb? Uh, anyone going for, we've got a couple of people. Anyone going for Oasis? Okay, there's a few people going Oasis. Suede, anyone go for Suede? Blur? Okay, someone's going for Blur. Uh, well... You're, for, <laughs> you're not a Britpop, you're not a 90s Britpop fan, that's okay, we're, not, we're waiting for bands that we know, that's okay. Um, I know it is going back a little way, uh, but anyway, well the answer actually was, we have it a correct answer, it was the Verve, they were the ones that produced this song, Bittersweet Symphony, it's useful to know for a trivia night or perhaps for the age quiz on a Saturday, but the song Bittersweet Symphony is a classic 90s hit. And indeed, Chris Martin from Coldplay said it was the best song ever written. And it still resonates today because the song has still had over one billion YouTube views. And the first line of the song seems to resonate with our human experience. Because it's a bittersweet symphony. That's life. Bittersweet means pleasure and joy tinged with sadness or pain. Bittersweet, feeling joy and sadness at the same time. And there are many bittersweet experiences in life. Like when you go somewhere amazing and then you return, hoping to replicate the experience, but when you go back, it's just not quite the same. It's a bit disappointing, it's somewhat bittersweet. In fact, it happened to me earlier this year when I drank an absolutely amazing non-alcoholic pina colada smoothie at a cafe up on High Street in Preston. In fact, it was so good that I said to my daughter, I said, she, you know, she likes a good smoothie as well, that it was the best smoothie I had ever had. So she believed me and then one Saturday afternoon we returned. I took Aoife to this uh, cafe for the best smoothie in the world and well, it was fine, it was sweet, it was tasty but it wasn't as thick or as good as the one I'd had before. It was a slightly bitter sweet experience. Sweet, to enjoy a lovely smoothie on High Street in the sun with my beautiful daughter, but a bit disappointing because it wasn't as great as I'd remembered it. But perhaps my most profound bittersweet experience was when I was 12 years old and I was living in the UK with my family. There's a picture of me coming from school at art one day. Some say I looked a bit like Harry Potter or something, but anyway, that was me in my school days. Now, we lived in the UK for three years and we were preparing to return home to come and live in Australia. And I was so looking forward to coming home. I was counting down the days and I just couldn't wait. Indeed, the school I was attending in the UK actually had boarding facilities. I was a day boy. And the headmaster quite liked me and suggested that I should stay on and board whilst my family returned to Australia. And I was devastated, even with that suggestion. I was desperate to return to Australia to see my extended family, my country, and experience warm summers again. I had such high expectations of returning home to Australia. Yet I distinctly remember, after returning, after only a very short period of time, I felt underwhelmed, disappointed. Life home just didn't live up to my heady expectations. Bittersweet. Yeah, it was good to be back and to see family, to lose my English accent, to play cricket and have some warm weather, but it wasn't perfect. It wasn't utopia. It didn't have some of the things that I actually really liked about living in Britain. Returning home was a bittersweet experience. And today in the Old Testament book of Ezra, we read about the bittersweet experience of the people of God returning to their home. We read about when they could have written their own 
bittersweet symphony. So what was so good and what was so painful and disappointing about their experience? And how does their experience resonate with the ups and downs of our own spiritual journeys? Well, let's have a look at Ezra chapter 3 and find out. So as I mentioned last week, the book of Ezra in the Old Testament part of the Bible was written about 450 BC. It's a history book recording events which occurred thousands of years ago. And those events occur right at the very end of Old Testament history. So reading Ezra is a little like entering the Star Wars universe by starting at verse episode 9 or starting the Harry Potter series by reading the Deathly Hallows. Because Ezra recounts the very end of the recorded history of the Old Testament. And it records a time when some of the promises of God seem to be coming true again. For in the Old Testament, God makes promises to redeem the world. At the start in Genesis, the Lord God promises certain things to Abraham. Now, can anyone remember what those three promises were? The three specific promises. Anyone remember? Anyone want to be brave enough to shout out what they can remember? Perhaps we touched on it last week, but some people might know them anyway. But anyway, anyone want to be brave enough to remember what they were? Land was one, yep. People, yeah, children, people, and blessing. Very good. Yay, that's right, yeah. Um, The Lord promises to create a special people to live in a special place under his rule and blessing and protection. And then as the Old Testament narrative unfolds, we learn that the people are the nation of Israel, which is distinct from the modern Israel, just to be clear about that, in a special land, the land of Canaan, and the promised land of uh, of Canaan, and blessing under the rule and protection of the Lord God. And the focus then of the nation of Israel was on Jerusalem, Zion, the city of God, and there they build a temple. Now, the temple wasn't just a tourist attraction, a nice building. It was the center of Jewish religious life. It was where the Lord's name dwelt, where the Ark of the Covenant, which was the law of the Lord, it was kept. It was where the people could meet with God, where their sins could be atoned for, and they could live with freedom, forgiveness, and blessing. And so then under the great kings of David and Solomon, which we read in the book of 1 Kings, these promises are fulfilled. As the nation of Israel becomes powerful and strong, so much so that foreign leaders like the Queen of Sheba marvel at the wealth and wisdom of the nation of Israel. But, due to the disobedience of the people of God, they reject the Lord, follow other gods and idols, and so the story of the ancient kingdom of Israel turns into a bit of a nightmare. After the heights and the power and strength under Solomon, due to their constant disobedience and evil, eventually Israel is punished. The kingdom's divided, then conquered, so that in 587 BC, Jerusalem itself was captured and destroyed by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. The temple was plundered and destroyed, And the Jewish inhabitants were all exiled. They were taken away to Babylon. The nation of Israel had gone from unity, riches and peace and prosperity to destruction, devastation and exile. The promises of God seem in tatters. But as we entered episode 9, started reading um, um, book number 7, Last week, as we learned from Ezra chapter 1 and 2, a few decades later, the Lord moved the heart of a new and powerful king of Persia, Cyrus, who had risen and conquered the Babylonian Empire to make a decree in Ezra 1, 2 to 3. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people coming among you must go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build a temple of the Lord the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. Here in Ezra, the people of God, the Israelites, could return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. So maybe, just maybe, the Lord was faithful to his promises. The nation was perhaps being restored, no longer exiled, but allowed to be a distinctive people again. 
allowed to return to their land, allowed to build a temple, allowed perhaps to receive the blessing of the Lord. So the people of God return home. The Lord moved the hearts of thousands of people to return to Jerusalem, to the promised land. And then in verse 1 of chapter 3, we see what happens when they return. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Okay, so they're back. The people have settled in, returned to their towns, set up their kitchens, made their beds. Now what? They're now unified together as one. That's a start. But what will they do? Will they be any different to their disobedient ancestors who neglected the Lord God? Well, we see some good news in verse 2. Then Joshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests in Zerubbabel, sorry, sorry, I've got to make sure I say that correctly, sorry, Zerubbabel, bubble, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, yes, that's right, thank you, son of Shealtiel, and his associates began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it, in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So the people of God have started well. They're unified and they're building an altar to make sacrifices to the Lord, the God of Israel. They seem to have learned their lessons. Remember the nation of Israel was punished and exiled because they had been, dis- they had been separated. They'd been, separ- they'd been separate and they'd worshipped other gods and they'd disobeyed the law. But here they do what the Solomon did at the original temple where he dedicated burnt offerings in line with the Lord of the Lord. Instead, indeed, they did this in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So this is encouraging. The people are unified, obeying the law, obeying the law, even in spite of what others around them might say. Verse 3, despite their fear of the peoples around them, they build the altar on its foundation and sacrifice burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both in mourning and and evening sacrifices. Now it's hard to stand out, to be different, to do what's right when everyone around you is disobedient. But the people of God here seem unperturbed by what others think of them and they're determined to do everything by the book, so to speak. They build an altar on exactly the spot as the previous temple. They seem to desire physical continuity between the two temples. And then they start regular festivals, sacrifices and offerings, in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses. They're observing the prescribed festivals which are outlined in the law of the Old Testament. This is such a great start. Their ancestors had been wicked, disobedient and neglected the law of the Lord, but these returnees, they're making the most of their second chance and they're making a great start. They're disobedient to the law of the Lord in their land, in his city. Sorry, they're, sorry, they're, uh, sorry they are obedient. Sorry, it's an imp- important thing to miss there. They're, they're actually obedient. They're no longer disobedient like their forefathers. They're obedient in the land, in his city. They're ensuring the purity of worship and purity of the people. This all seems very, very sweet. Despite their fear, the, fear, the people of God offered sacrifices according to the law of the Lord. So then, in keeping with this great start, the people begin rebuilding the actual temple of God. They start making sacrifices, but the foundations of the temple haven't been laid. Until we read in verse 7. Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters that gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre, so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa, as authorised by Cyrus, king of Persia. So here they're getting the materials ready for construction. And much to their credit, they get materials which match the first temple. Now, I know it can be difficult when doing a, a renovation or a restoration to match the original techniques and materials. And actually, that's what they're doing uh, when, they're, it's when they're trying to rebuild Notre Dame Cathedral in France. That's what they're having to try to do, to try to match the original techniques and materials. But this is exactly what these returnees are doing when, with the construction of the new temple. They're making it in exactly the same way as the original temple. So if we go back a couple of Old Testament books to 1 Chronicles 22, 
where King David was getting construction materials together for the first temple, we see he, David, also provided more cedar logs than can be counted. For the Sidonians and Tyrians had brought large numbers of them to David. So where does David get his cedar logs for the temple from? Which two cities? Tyre and Sidon, exactly. Now where do the people in Ezra's time, where do they now get the cedar for the building of the temple? From Tyre and Sidon. They're trying to rebuild things exactly like the first temple that was destroyed. And this is the theme of the temple construction. The people are attempting to build the temple in the same way as the first one. Now, I think the reason for this is to emphasize continuity with the people and the promises of God. That despite the exile, that even though the people have gone back to Babylon, even though physically the second temple wasn't quite the same as the first, yet from the point of view of worship, nothing had changed. They were still God's people following God's law and fulfilling his promises. Same God, same promises, same people, same temple. And so construction begins. What was shattered under the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar is being rebuilt. It's exciting when the foundations of a new building are laid. In fact, they actually used to be foundation stone ceremonies, which celebrated the laying of foundations of a new building, which usually attracted onlookers from far and wide. So this is a picture of the crowd of people who gathered to, lay, to celebrate the laying of the, su- the southern foundation stone of the Sydney Harbour Bridge in March 1925. And here's another crowd gathered, uh, who gathered to see the laying of the foundation stone of the Melbourne Exhibition um, Building in February 1879. And so we read what happens then when they lay the foundations to the new temple in Ezra chapter 3. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments with the trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. There was great celebration, music, colour, vestments, and they praised the Lord. And this wasn't meaningless or unfocused. They were doing things as prescribed by David, king of Israel. Again, people are maintaining continuity with the previous temple. But this celebration wasn't just the laying of foundations of a notable building. This was the temple of the Lord, the house of the Lord, the house where the Lord himself was to dwell where sacrifice for sins were to be made, where purity and forgiveness could be found. And so they sing. And what do they sing? He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. But why this particular song? Well, it's a significant song for the people of God, but this was the same song sang when the original temple was dedicated under Solomon. It would be a little like having a rendition of Hayden's with verdure clad sung here at North Baptist Church after a renovation because that song was performed in this very building at the very first church service ever held here in December 1909. And so they sing the very same song that was sung. That's That's got good resonance, hasn't it? They sing the same song that was sung. That's a tongue twister. Maybe you should try saying that later. They sing the same song that was sung when the original temple was built by Solomon and was dedicated in two chronicles. When all the musicians, priests, Levites were all dressed up and singing, He is good. His love endures forever. They sang of the goodness and the love of the Lord at the dedication of that first temple. But even though those ancestors were disobedient and that temple was destroyed, The God to whom they dedicated it is the same. They're the same people, the same promises. And so now with renewed hearts, they dedicate the construction of this new temple. And so it's equally appropriate to sing. He is good. His love endures forever. For the Lord is good. 
He's faithful to his promises. He's created a people. He has done great things. He has performed a mighty work to bring them back from Jerusalem from exile. And he continues to promise to guide them, to protect them, to dwell with them, to bring them peace, to forgive them, to love them. And the temple in particular represented God's faithfulness to his promises, his care, his presence, his forgiveness. So the nation of Israel were back. They were still a people, back in their land, and they were experiencing blessing again, the love and goodness of the Lord. And so construction of the temple begins to much fanfare. fanfare. But... But the reaction to laying of the foundations is mixed. Ezra 3, 12 to 13. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. While many others shouted for joy, no one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise. And the sound was heard far away. There are two reactions to the foundations being laid. One is joy, for the temple of the Lord was being rebuilt. But this was mixed with weeping. It was the older priests and Levites who had seen the former temple who wept. So why why did they weep? Was it because they were so overcome with emotion that things were back on track and the glory of the Lord was to be restored? Possibly. Possibly. But I think that this weeping is recorded by way of contrast to the shouts of joy. The young people rejoiced, but the older people generation wept. They were probably happy that they were pleased the temple was being built. But looking at the foundations of this new temple, it just wasn't going to be the same as the previous temple. The older people aren't being whiny or, you know, saying, back in my day, you know, or things, or things were better, or those were the days, my friend. They were not saying that. No, the, they'd seen the former temple, and they'd realized that it wasn't going to be quite the same as Solomon's temple. It wasn't going to be as glorious. It was bitter sweet. Indeed, the experience of the people of God returning to Jerusalem was bitter sweet. They could have sung their own bittersweet symphony. Great to be back in the promised land, but it wasn't quite matching their expectations or their memories, nor what was even promised them by God. Indeed, this whole chapter and the return of the people is bittersweet. Sweet because the people of God were free from their captivity and their exile in Babylon, but bitter because, well, they weren't really free. They're still subject to a Persian king. It was sweet that God had moved the heart of Cyrus to allow the exiles to return home, but bitter because they couldn't be ruled by a Jewish king. Jerusalem wasn't the city of a king anymore. They were no longer a great independent nation where people came to marvel at their wisdom. It was sweet that now a temple could be built and the Lord could meet with his people and dwell among them and that their sins could be atoned for, but bitter that this second temple was smaller less magnificent, less glorious than the former temple. The return to Jerusalem was good, demonstrating the Lord's love, his faithfulness and power, but it was also a little underwhelming, not as glorious as the former temple. Bittersweet, a bittersweet return. But I wonder if This just reflects life in this world, that life itself is bittersweet. The lyrics of the Verve's Bittersweet Symphony start, it's a bittersweet symphony, that's life, trying to make ends meet, you're a slave to money, then you die. Life feels like a bittersweet symphony. Like the Israelites, it's good to have a temple, be back in their land, but the return is just not the same. We're not really free and it's just a bit disappointing. This reflects life, bittersweet, where here in Melbourne we have many good things, the blessings of life, health, friendship, community, at times even prosperity. But these things are always tinged with disappointment, that things aren't quite right, that things don't always live up to our expectations, be it smoothies or returning home or 
The shadow of death always looms large. In fact, one of the commenters on the YouTube video of Bittersweet Symphony said, I'm a nurse. Every time someone dies during my shift, I listen to this song during my drive home from work. Been a tradition for almost 10 years now. Death. It makes life the ultimate bitter experience. You make money and then you die. Eric Little, the great and famous Christian athlete who won gold in the 1924 Olympic Games, died tragically of a brain tumour in China, aged only 43. Life, death, blessing, disappointment. Our lives now, even as Christian believers, are a bittersweet symphony. But the problem is that God didn't promise to the Israelites that life would be bittersweet. He didn't. He promised full blessing, a land of good things, flowing with milk and honey, long life, prosperity, not bittersweet, just sweet. But the good news is that the temple that was built in Ezra's time is not the greatest demonstration of the Lord's goodness or blessing. Rebuilding this temple was not the greatest demonstration of the Lord's love. Because this new temple that Ezra was building was just a shadow of something greater. For even this new temple now under construction would one day suffer the same fate as Solomon's temple. It would also be destroyed. But this does not mean that the Lord is not good or loving. For the ultimate expression of the love and goodness of the Lord was expressed not in stone and cedar buildings, but in the coming of Jesus Christ, the new, superior, eternal temple, through whom the Lord demonstrates his goodness and love in the most profound way, as Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Lord is good. He died for us, the ultimate sacrifice for sins, the full atonement for our sins. And then through Jesus' resurrection from the dead, Jesus opens up a new and living hope, the eternal hope of glory, a hope that is beyond buildings or temples or land, but a new heavens and a new earth. Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. The same promise that was given to Ezra. Here it is. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. For God's people, this new heavens, this new earth will be like going home. Home to a place of eternal rest. Home to where our Lord and Saviour dwells. Home where there is no temple, because He will dwell with us. He will be our God and we will be His people. Where going home will not be disappointing at all. For we are a place where His love towards His people truly endures forever and ever. It is the hope that drove Eric Little, the bigger prize, the eternal prize, and it's the hope that drives us, the hope of glory, the promise of life that will never, ever be bitter. But for those who rest in the death of Jesus for our sins and his resurrection for eternal life, life will only ever be sweet. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you are good and that your love endures forever. Help us to trust you and live for you throughout the bitter and sweet times of our lives, knowing that in all things you are good and through Jesus your love endures forever and you will safely bring us home. In his name. Amen.